All right, good evening. It is um, time for Psalms and Wisdom, night number five. This is the last night we're gonna focus uh, specifically on the Psalms. But tonight's kind of a transition night because we're gonna study wisdom Psalms and that's gonna lead us right into the next four weeks, which is the study of wisdom, well, wisdom literature. So um, I was, uh, for those that are watching this online, I was letting those here on the Zoom uh, know before we start recording, um, I have been working and on the Wisdom Bible Study, and I'm pretty excited about it, actually. Uh, we're going to go through a little Proverbs, uh, some Ecclesiastes, and then um, in with Song of Songs, which is interesting because I don't know that I've ever taught Song of Songs. I mean, I've read it, but I don't know that I've ever actually tried to teach it. Get ready. It's better than, I mean, you don't need daytime TV. You just need Song of Songs, let me tell you. It is certainly something else. In fact, one of my slides, I think the, one of the words is, whoa. <laughs> we, in fact, I think we say, can we study this? You know, <laughs> so, uh, so that'll be the last night. But uh, so again, we're going to start wisdom literature starting next week. But tonight, uh, we're going to study wisdom psalms, which is going to be a beautiful lead in to wisdom literature. Okay. So let, uh, let's join in a word of prayer. Um, it's been a tough day in the life of our church. So uh, we lost someone today and um, that's always a hard day. And so I feel like it's always a good thing for us to pray. So uh, let's join together as a community and, and I'll lead us in prayer. Gracious and holy God, come to you tonight with a heavy heart. There's a lot of people on my my mind, a lot of people in all of our minds and hearts. There's many in our community right now that are dealing with the pandemic one way or the other. Some who have the disease, some now we know who have passed from the disease, some who are caring for others, some who are school nurses and others trying to keep people safe. Some are the doctors and the nurses caring for them. Tonight, Lord, my heart is heavy for all of them. So I just ask God that for the next 45, 50 minutes, would you help us to focus in on your scriptures? May we learn something. May we uh, engage with you. May we learn something new about you tonight, feel something new about you tonight, and be reminded that you are indeed the God who is in control of all things, the God who loves us, the God who absolutely is with us every step of our journey. And because we believe that, God, we lift up all the people we name on our hearts before you tonight. And we ask that your will be done, your healing, your wholeness, and your touch. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's study some wisdom psalms. Let me share my screen with you. There we go. Let me start the slideshow. There we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at wisdom psalms, and I want to go through some basic information. Now, these are going to be a hair bit different than what we studied um, the last few weeks because these don't have a real specific pattern. So what we've looked at so far in the Psalms has been the pattern. So if you remember when we studied praise Psalms and Thanksgiving Psalms, lament Psalms, world Psalms, they all had a pattern. And, and as we studied, we kept looking for that pattern and what that pattern would teach us. And then if, you know, if you, if you were able to, I, I gave you some Psalms to go look at. I hope that you did some of that. If you didn't go do it sometime. And you'll see those patterns and you'll begin to understand, oh, I get it. I know where we're headed. I know why we're headed there. Wisdom Psalms are a little different. Wisdom Psalms are not as easy um, to put into a pattern. But what Wisdom Psalms do have is they have some very specific features. And we're going to go over those in a minute. So what are Wisdom Psalms? Wisdom Psalms um, are Psalms that seek to highlight what it means to follow in the footsteps of God. They can refer both to the wisdom that comes from God 
and from living out a righteous life. So wisdom psalms talk about God's wisdom. So God is, is wise. God is all-knowing. God created the heavens and the earth. God is in control of all those things. That's wisdom, okay? And, and, and actually, next week, next week when we study, sorry, let me turn my phone off. Next week when we study, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, wisdom literature, we're going to learn a lot about that for, um, for the writers of the wisdom literature. Uh, wisdom is basically the knowledge of God and, and comes from God. It helps us understand God. And we're going to go over that in great, great detail next, uh, next week, actually. But these Psalms highlight that part. They also highlight what it means to live a righteous life. So let me ask you, if I just said to you, what does it mean to live a righteous life, a holy life? What are some things, go ahead and unmute. What are some things that you might say? Like, what, is, what would be part of a righteous life, do you think? Prayer. Prayer, good. What else? Daddy. Devotion. Say that again. Devotion. Devotion, prayer, devotion, good. What else? Obedience. Obedience. That's a tough word, by the way. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> but a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's, a, there's obviously hundreds of words, but you're, you're nailing some great ones. When we read them tonight, I, I want you to look for some of those key words. Uh, look for some of those words that deal with um, a righteousness. Because one of the things that these wisdom psalms are going to do is talk about what it means for us to live righteous lives, holy lives, wise lives, okay? So be looking for those things as we study tonight. Who wrote them? Well, these are about the most buried in, this, in the book of Psalms. Um, there are Psalms attributed to David, Solomon, others. Uh, some don't have authors. Um, this is hard, too, because not all scholars agree on which Psalms are wisdom and which aren't. What I gave you in your syllabus, um, especially Psalm 1 and 37 are generally agreed upon. The others that I gave you, most scholars agree on. That's the best I'm going to say. Most <laughs> scholars agree on. Uh, but, I mean, they're all important. They're, they're, they're in the book. They're in the Bible. But are they wisdom psalms? Some of them, you know, again, some scholars think they are, some think they don't. But what we know is that they're written by various authors. Now, when we get to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, most of those are going to be attributed to one author, and that would be Solomon. Um, traditionally, at least. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get there, but you're going to be looking at uh, tonight things that are written by various, uh, various groups, various people, but all with that same idea that God is wise or that it is wise to lead a righteous life. Okay. Wisdom Psalms call those reciting them to walk in the path of righteousness. There is a stark delineation between wise and foolish. I want to stop there for a second and talk about that. One of the things you're going to notice, and if you did your reading this week, you'll notice it in some of the very first Psalms that you read. The psalmist doesn't mix any words. There is a wise way to do things, and there is a foolish way to do things. Okay, there is no in between. If you do it the way God asks you to, or you do it the right, the righteous way, then you're doing it the wise way. If you're doing it out of ambition or self conceit or anything, you know, any malice, you're doing it with foolishness. And 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 that is a big, big, big delineation when it comes to wisdom. Uh, especially the wisdom literature of the Bible, and especially these wisdom psalms. There is a, a, a line in the sand between the wise and the foolish. 
So remember that when you're reading these, be looking for, okay, is this something, is the psalmist speaking about these things are the things the wise do? Or is the psalmist saying these are things that the foolish shouldn't do? Okay. Because you're going to see both of those um, in the book of, in this, uh, the wisdom Psalms here in, in tonight's uh, uh, study. Okay. Let's look at some things, some features. Move this over for just a second. I found that I can move the, move you all around my screen and it helps because then people that are watching later can actually read the slides. So I, I had to move you all over for a moment. Features of wisdom songs. First, there is a sharp contrast between the righteous and the wicked. We just talked about that. Um, that is, oops, sorry. That is essential. Uh, that number one. Let me back up. There we go. Sharp contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Again, there's no in between here. What you see is what you you know what you get. What you what you know to be true. What you know to be right. You need to do. Otherwise, you're doing the things of the wicked. Okay. The next one, next feature. There is in this world, isn't it? Say that again. Hold on. Uh, I'll stop for a second. Say that again, Doug. That's a contrast in this world. People think <laughs> it's, uh, it's okay. If they, if they think it's okay, it's okay. Oh, you're talking about relativism. Um, yes. So, so it's interesting that you make that comparison. Uh, uh, again, we're, we're, you're 100% you're on track here. One of, the things that, one of the things that we learn from wisdom psalms is there is a way to do things. Now, not everybody agrees on how that is, but there is a way to do things, and there's a way not to do things. And, and you're right. Um, I think wisdom psalms have great things to say um, to today's world. I think in a lot of ways, they are words that really could give us guidance for how we deal with one another, how we deal with issues, how we deal with problems, how we deal with our own life. Because when you, when you realize that there's a stark contrast between rich, righteous and wicked, there's a good, a right way, a wise way, and a foolish way. You know, I know, I mean, not very many people go, hey, I want to do it the foolish way, right? I think people want to do it the wise way. But what that is, well, we're going to talk about that over the next couple of nights, actually, because that's going to lead us right. That, that's why tonight was a great uh, bridge, because we'll talk about wisdom psalms and writing to wisdom literature, which is all about that. What all does right. the slide say after either? Uh, or before misfortune? Welfare. Welfare? Okay, thanks. Welfare or misfortune, yeah. Um, advice that, that about conduct that results in either welfare or misfortune. So remember that one of, the, one of the things that's a little different for us, there's a, especially around 1000 BC, the time of David and Solomon, there's a real thought. Um, if you look at the scholarship during that time, there's a real thought um, it's what we call Deuteronomistic thought. And what that is, is that if you do good, you get good. And if you do bad, you get bad. It's as simple as that. If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. Now, look, that sounds great in theory, but most of us, I think, would probably agree that's not, uh, that doesn't always hold, right? <laughs> um, Sometimes I wish it did. Sometimes I wish it didn't. But the reality is we, we sometimes, we, we know, we actually we really do. We know that that doesn't hold. But it doesn't mean there aren't people who think that. Listen to people talk, right? You hear people talk like this all the time. Well, if you'd have done it right, it would have worked out. If you hadn't done that wrong, this wouldn't have happened to you. Well, it's more complicated than that. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little bit of a foreshadow. Some of the wisdom writers are going to say, that's the way it is. And some of the wisdom writers, especially in Job and Ecclesiastes, are going to say, that ain't the way it is at all. Okay? So just think about that as, as we go. Okay. Is 
that what they call karma now? Is that? Um, pro yeah, uh, that's definitely a, a way to view karma is, you know, you get, you reap, you know, it's not just reap what you sow, but it's, if I do something good, I get something good. If I do something bad, I get something bad. Yeah. Um, and, and again, look, I will tell you, while I don't believe that philosophy holds, I mean, there's plenty of examples where the righteous don't, don't, don't prosper and where the, the wicked do. But I will say, you listen hard enough, and there are a lot of people who believe that philosophy. Okay? There are a ton of people who believe in that philosophy. And as long as they, you know, and, and look, there's a part of me that wants to believe in that philosophy. There's a part of me that says, hey, if I do good, then I'm going to get good. And if I do bad, then well, I deserve it. I get bad. But sometimes I do good and get bad. And sometimes I do bad and end up getting good. How do I explain that? Well, that's what some of the wisdom, again, both sides are you're going to hear in the wisdom literature. Good, good, good questions. Good questions. Let's look at another feature. <clears throat> the premise that the fear of Yahweh is the starting point of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Now, let's talk about that term in quotation marks, the fear of Yahweh, the fear of the Lord. This isn't talking about fear as in I'm afraid. This is not that version of fear. What do you think that phrase means? When you hear fear of the Lord in this context, what are you thinking about? What do you think that means? Respect. Respect. Excellent word. Excellent word. What's another one? Love. Love. Good word. Reverence. Reverence. Excellent. Excellent. I usually like the word awe. You know, um, so all, of, but that's what this means. So some people, again, if you read this in English, you go, oh, the fear of the Lord. Oh, I'm, 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 you know, God is big and I am little and I should fear God. No, 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 no. That's not what this is about, I promise. <laughs> this is about that, that respect, awe, love for God. That is the starting point of wisdom. I think that's really powerful because one of the, one of the things, the philosophies that I really do live by um, comes from St. Anselm in the uh, 10th century. St. Anselm of Canterbury, he wrote an interesting treatise called uh, Why God Man. It, it, it's what, it, it, you translate it directly, it's Why God Man. It's why God became man. And in that treatise, St. Anselm talks about um, this phrase that I just, I just love, that we are people of faith who seek understanding. We are not people of understanding who receive faith. Let me say that again. We are people who have faith that seek understanding. See, we, we respect God with our faith, and then we understand. We don't have to fully understand so that we get faith. That's backwards to Anselm. It's a great treatise. It's one of the things that truly opened my, opened my, my theological mind to, um, to really understanding what I think a real relationship with God is about. For me, it starts with faith and it grows from there. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be all defined and then you have faith. That's backwards. So here, the psalmist, the, the wisdom psalms would agree with that. The fear or the awe or the respect of God, Yahweh, that's the starting point of wisdom. Excuse me. Let's look at another one. Comparisons and admonitions that are used to exhort one to good conduct. You're going to see this a little bit in the wisdom psalms and a lot when we get to the wisdom literature where something is compared to something else. Here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't. Or here's what you shouldn't. Here's what you should. <laughs> and they're always put plushed together. That comparison, that contrast, okay? So be looking for those as we study tonight. 
better than sayings. You're going to see these in the Psalms. You're going to see these next week in wisdom literature. But something, something, something is better than something else. Comparison talk, okay? So be looking for those. Use your, you know, use your English skills here of simile and metaphor, comparison, contrast, compare, contrast, okay? You'll need all those skills because something, something, something is better than or not better than. And you need to be looking for those, those conversations, okay? The approving word or blessing. Uh, this is when you see you've done something good, there's an approval. You might see the word blessing. You might see in some translations the word happy. But this idea that if you do the things that are wise, you will be blessed. Okay. So be looking for those as well. Psalm 112, verse 2. Uh, we'll say what again? Psalm 112, verse 2. 112, verse 2. Let me look. Yep. 100%, that would be correct. And I mean, that is definitely a wisdom psalm, and that is definitely a piece of wisdom. Very good. Good pickup. That's really what we're going to do tonight, actually. We're going to read some of these psalms and look for these uh, six characteristics. All right, let's look at Psalm 1. I mean, we've read everything else in the Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 1, like where the book starts. So somebody, if you would, read just Psalm 1, 1. Read it loud, please. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, okay. but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. All right, stop right that there. Person, stop, hold on right there. Let, let's, oh. let's hold that for just a second. So when you, bless it, like uh, you, read it, you read it and, and, and you actually hit the right notes. Doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand with sinners, doesn't sit in the seats of mockers. And if you do those things, if you don't do those bad things, Look at what it said. What's the very first word? Blessed. Blessed. Now, when have you seen that word before in your Bible study? You ever, you have any, any recollection in your mind where you might have seen the word blessed are some things before? I've seen those uh, Beatitude things. The Beatitudes, yeah. Matthew 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Sometime, um, go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. Go look at those, um, go look at those, oh, th those, those, those pieces in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and you'll be amazed at the wisdom that is really in there. You know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They don't seem right on the front side, but when you really look at them and dig, you're like, oh. Oh, that's wisdom. So the opening to the psalm here in Psalm 1 is absolutely one of those blessed statements. All right, go ahead and somebody read 2 and 3. Doug, you started reading it. Go ahead and finish that if you would. Go back and start and read verse 2, Doug Fryman, and read through verse 3, please. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. All right. The reverence of Yahweh. Think about that. Delight in the Lord. That idea that if you walk in the law and you meditate day and night, you're planting, I mean, these beautiful, beautiful words, right? but they're all talking about the goodness of Yahweh. So put those two together for a second. Blessed are those who don't do this, but those who reverence, who give reverence, awe, fear the Lord, look what happens to them. They're his delight. They yield food. They yield fruit in season. Their leaves don't wither. They prosper. Do you see the difference between those two? Verse 1 and verse 2 and 3, 
Don't do all those things. Do these things. Right? I don't need you to help me. I don't need you to help me. Okay? Thanks. I guess the dog is doing, you're doing the, the bad things. Um, <laughs> so, but reverence to God, beautiful stuff. Let's read the rest of that song. Somebody else read four through six, please. Not so the wicked. They are like shaft that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Well, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Contrast between wise and wicked. Tell me one of the contrasts you see right there. Obedience is prosperity. Obedience is prosperity. Obedience. What's the other side of that? Disobedience is failure. Is failure or destruction, yeah. Good. So if you do what's right, you're going to be okay, probably. If you don't do what's right, you're certainly not going to be okay. Yes. And interestingly enough, the first part of this psalm actually describes that. Right? Yeah. Right. Don't, uh, you know, blessed is the one, right, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand with the sinners or the mockers. Don't do that. But the one who delights in the Lord, he's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield fruit. Good, good pickup. Good pickup. Real good pickup. Somebody else, what else do you see? What is another contrast here between the, raw, the wise and the wicked? It's easier to, to write than to say. Look in verse 4, 5, and 6. What else do you see? Well, if you're if you're godly, you get you will you will pass the judgment. Okay, so there's an element of judgment. Godly, we'll pick up. Mm -hmm. You will not pass judgment. You will go. Mm. That's right. The wicked will not stand during the judgment. That is correct. The uh, shaft just blows the unrighteous away, but the but the righteous stand. Yeah. So again, that that that's another. You know, we talked about these are these are at their heart prayers and poems, and so that language. If you think about the the chaff being blown away, it's no more. It's not. Also, it yields fruit. Say that again. It yields fruit versus withering. It does. I said also it yields fruit versus withering. That's correct. Yields fruit fruit versus withering. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the things you're talking about, I want you to think about other Bible studies you've taken, especially about like Romans, the book, we're talking about salvation, or even the Gospel of John. These are the images. You know, if you remember from your study of the Gospel of John, man, you're either in or you're out. <laughs> There's no gray. You know, when you read uh, Paul in the book of Romans, you know, this is what he talks about. There, there is, there is right. There is there is salvation for the righteous and destruction for the wicked. These are the things that that we 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 know. These are concepts. Wisdom literature is concepts that we know. We just don't always study them here. We we they're they're all chock full in the New Testament. So much of what we read, especially when it comes to salvation history, comes from the wisdom. Okay, 100%. And then I don't want us to miss this one. This is an important one. In verse six, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked perishes. Again, I can't read that verse, even though I know it was written a thousand years later, but I cannot miss John saying about Jesus that he's the way. And, and I, I, I read that. If you follow, I mean, what's John's premise in the gospel? If you follow Jesus, if you follow the person who's named the way, then you'll live. And if you don't, you won't. <laughs> Very much out of 
the wisdom understanding of the wisdom literature itself. And in this case, wisdom psalms. So let me read it to you again, now that we've, now that we've talked about it. And this time what I want you to do, I'm gonna read the whole thing. It's only six verses. But what I'd like you to do is in one or two words, I'm gonna limit us here, one or two words. When you hear all of this, now that we've studied it, and I'm gonna read it for you again, what one word or two words describes how you feel when you hear this particular song, okay? So pay attention to your feelings for a second, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask you those questions. Let's, let's listen again. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right, one or two words. What does that make you feel? You have a choice. Okay, you use the word choice. Good, good word. Why did you say choice? Because you have, you can choose God or you can choose not God. Un God. Yep. Okay. Somebody else. Hopeful. Hopeful. Good. Why'd you say hopeful? Well, there's always hope. You mm -hmm. know, you're not always going to be righteous, but there is hope that you will turn your ways to righteousness. Correct. And there's God. Yep. Passages like this used to just really scare me because it talks so much about, and some of them will say, I am righteous. And I would think, no, I'm not. Until I realized yep. that even though it's not really said, it's under the foundation underlying is, is that Christ is coming. Sybil, that is very, very, very astute. That's a great pickup. One of the things I know that many scholars that write about this text is this is a divine wake up call. You know, you said hopeful, and I agree with that, uh, Vicki. 100% I agree with that. But there's also a if you don't do this, there are consequences. And, and you can look at that from the consequence of there are good consequences of, of hope, but there are also bad consequences of destruction. Wisdom, wisdom Psalms, wisdom literature has a lot of that. But, but I like, Doug, what you said about the word choice. It's you have the choice to do it one way or the other. Um, and and that's, that's what is... Hopeful and scary. I think both those words are 100% accurate when you look at wisdom psalms. Good. That's Psalm 1. Let's look at another one. Turn over to Psalm 37. <clears throat> this one's a little bit longer. We're not going to read all of the psalm. I hope that you've already read it, but some of it's kind of repetitive but we're going to look at some of the highlights of this psalm. Okay. So if you look at from this as a, as a whole, you'll see a lot of the contrast between wise and wicked. That's what most of this psalm is about. But I want us to go through a little bit of individual pieces. And... Um, I'm going to read this so that I can, I can kind of skip around, but let's start in verse one and I'll tell you where I'm going to, where I'm going to go to. Okay. Well, let's start in verse one. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong for like the grass, they will soon wither like green plants. They will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good dwell in the land 
enjoy pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see the contrast between the wise and the wicked. It's, it's very prevalent, right? But I want to look now. Let's go to verse 16, and let's see something else. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. There's one of those better than statements. Now, let's take the better than out for a minute. Little that the righteous have versus the wealth of the wicked. If I just told you that somebody had a little and somebody had a lot, who would you assume is the righteous? Are we talking it's about okay it. It's okay to say it. Are we talking about money? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't give you a, uh, an antecedent. I just gave you the, the, the perspective. You know, got a subject there you want to talk about on little and... No. <laughs> Good, good, good job. Yeah, you see how this works is when we, we start to think about it, and we again, that whole, well, if I do good, I get good. If I do bad, I get bad. So the one who has a lot must be the good guy. And the one who has a little must be the bad guy. Or the, uh, you know, the white, the wise and the wicked. And, and on first glance, I think that's how people would view that. I mean, it goes back to things like we did in the Beatitudes, right? We were talking about that a few minutes ago. You know, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who, who cry now. I mean, really? They don't feel blessed to me, but they are. You see, the better than statements turn things on their head. Because again, the world looks at it and says, well, they have a lot of wealth and this one has little. They're better. They must be better than. The ones who have the wealth must be better than the one who has little. If you look at implicit bias, we do this all the time. Right or wrong, even we in the you know, enlightened, woke culture of the 21st century, we still do this. And, and, and it's, it is a, a real issue. Because we look at people and we go, well, they must have a lot. They must, they, must do, they must be righteous. They must do the right thing. But listen to this again. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. That's a pretty powerful statement. What do you, what do you take from that? How do you justify that? Doug, you were pushing me a little and you were right to do so. When you asked, well, what are you talking about? Money or faith or what, what do you think? Why, why, would, why would having a little and being righteous be better than having a lot and being wicked? Well, I think you could be uh, righteous and have a lot. But you wonder where you got all that lot from. Did he get it from, what happened to those people that he got it from? Did he get it righteously or did he get it wrongly? Uh, correct. We don't know, do we? No. There seems to be an assumption, though, that some, something about the wicked has done something, something wrong. Okay, good. What else? Anybody else have a thought about that? A hard worker deserves benefits of his hard work. Okay. As long as it doesn't, and not at the expense of someone else's hard work true i can live with that yeah somebody else what else do you see why would the psalmist make this claim that it's better the better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked i think i think there's an unspoken reference to the temporal and the eternal say more about that Elaborate. well we get we get caught up in this life but it's so brief and we're talking about eternity eventually 
Okay. And that's where the real riches are. Uh, it's interesting you say that. I, I, would, I believe that there is something to what you're saying. Um, I think there, there's definitely a, a, a movement of Christians who, um, who would agree with that. that, that especially as you read it from a Christian perspective, you can read that back in there. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me clue you in though. Listen very closely again. Listen for, listen for why it's better. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The wicked are depending on their own power, but the righteous are given power and upheld by the Lord. Yes, because ultimately what's going to happen to the power of the wicked. It's going to be broken. It's going to be what? Say that again, Sue? Broken. Broken. Yeah. yeah. So the wicked can't take it with them. No. Nope. See, one of the things that happens is, and, 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 and we've all done, look, this is one of the, this is one of those sins that we all struggle with and we will all struggle with is this idea of I need to have enough to care for myself. Well, sure you do. We all need that. That's, a, that's not a wrong thing. The question is, do we rely on ourselves and our own wealth and our own power and our own prestige and our own stuff? Is that where we draw who we are from? Because sometimes we do. But I think if you do that and you put your, you're putting your, your, your faith and, and your trust in things that are not eternal, which goes back to what Sybil was saying, which goes back to things that are not righteous. And that's the, that's the, that's the thing that makes this difficult is this statement right here really, really pushes at us and says, look, the reason it's better to have a little and be righteous is that that doesn't go away. When you, when you are part of the wicked, yours will. And that does, it, it, it's that longer, it, it, it's, like trying, it's like trying to convince, you know, your kid or your grandkid that they should start saving for retirement when they're young. Well, I'm never going to need that. That's so far away. I mean... You know, I, I, I wasn't very long ago, I was saying those things. And now I'm like, man, my hair is gray and I can actually, you know, retirement is, you know, half, I'm halfway there. And, and it's just, you know, it's like, whoa, but, but it's hard to make that uh, people understand that because it's a long-term vision. See, one of the things that wisdom really talks about, especially the wisdom Psalms is a longer view. We live in a, 24-7, right now, I need it yesterday world. So if I can get it, I'm going to get it. The, the psalmist here says, yeah, but in the long run, do you have the things that actually matter? Do you have the things that make you righteous? That's a much different statement. Good, good stuff. Yeah, 37.5. I'm going to read that for us. I don't know how those got out of order. Sorry about that. 37.5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. If you'll commit to the good life, what does the Lord promise? According to the psalmist. If you'll the commit way of the Lord. Huh? The way of the Lord. The way of the Lord? Uh -huh. What else? Look at the images. Light. It gives light. Light. You ever heard that one before? Yeah. 
Oh, by the way. Another Christ is the light. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, and by the way, the end of the Beatitudes talks about that we are salt and light. There's no, no coincidence there, by the way. Yeah, when we commit to the good things, then our light shines. There's a reverse to this. Now, it's not here, but there are other songs where there's a reverse. When we do wicked, what, what happens? Must be darkness. It's darkness. And, and what do you think they really mean? What, what's the metaphor for light and dark here? What are they talking about? Good and evil. Good and evil. What else? What was that? What, what are they talking about when they say light and dark here? No, what, what, somebody what, answered you. She did. She What'd said she good say? and evil. I said, absolutely. Oh, good and evil. Okay. What else? Heaven and hell. Heaven and hell. Righteousness and judgment, yeah. Righteousness and judgment. Yeah. All the way down to fundamentally faithfulness and unfaithfulness. This is fundamental, my friends. This is the kind of stuff that, again, makes me go, oh, man. Because this is the stuff that really speaks volumes. Because this is the words and the phrases that we absolutely have in our hymns, in our music. It is words that we preach on as Christians all the time. And they are words that clearly the writers of the New Testament pick up on because you see it everywhere. And, and, and again, we talk about this a lot, but, but one of the reasons we study the Psalms is that, I mean, Jesus quotes from the Psalms more than anything else because he grew up with them. Right? Paul grew up with them. Being a Paul being a a a, a, a you know a, the Jew of the Jews, right? Being a, a Pharisee, he would have gone to synagogue worship and recited the Psalms as part of his growing up. These are part of who they become. And these wisdom psalms, especially, we see them carry out those themes on and on and on as we get to the New Testament. Well, this is what's wrong with the culture right now is there is no right and wrong and kids aren't being taught the difference. <laughs> I mean, everything is gray and, you know, altered and somehow made to be a choice other than what the two are, right or wrong. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because when next week when we start studying the Proverbs, one of the, one of the goals of the book of Proverbs, at least it sets it out from the front, is it's almost like a wise sage speaking to a younger generation. Here's some things I learned. Don't, don't, don't make those mistakes. Do these things, don't do those things. You know, we learn from one another. Um, so the, song, the Proverbs really are a great book of mentoring uh, from, you know, somebody who clearly wants to share wisdom with others. And like I said, we'll talk about that again some more next week, but you're right on top of that. So, I want, to, I want to push at that a little bit. we got about three more minutes, and, and, and I want to use that little short time to, to ask you the question that Sue just brought up. These are great, and I love studying them. I do. But as I've told you many times before, they're only great insofar as they speak to our soul, allow us to speak to God, and, and actually do something. How do you think, we've gone through five different versions of Psalms, five different types of Psalms. There are, and by the way, there are so many more. You can break these down 500, 600 way, it doesn't matter. But you've written through the book of Psalms now. We've looked at quite a few of them together. What do you think the Psalms are good for? I, I don't care whether it's praise, lament, thanksgiving, royal, or now wisdom. Why, why do you think we still read them? Should we still read them? Do they really say anything for us now? Do, we, do, they, do, they, do they mean anything? Why, why, why do a study on the Psalms? Well, when I was reading the first three, I thought of it being a um, book of promises almost. Okay. And I didn't see it as a contrast between this and that, but it was like all the way through, that if you do this, it's what's going to happen. And since I'm already a, theoretically on that path, you know, it's felt like promises. Good. 
But no. then, when I, then when I got over to the end of the, the night's assignment, uh, in light of the bad day you had, whoops. I know. We just went off, didn't we? Mm -mm. No, we're on. You're, you're still on. I must have hit something. I must have hit something then. You're can on. You hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you see you. Oh, okay. And, and I don't want to put a damper on the evening, but, you know, in, tar in terms of uh, how we feel about losing Nelda and so forth, I, I really at the end thought, oh my gosh, you know, we do, the, I mean, we do this, we do that, we believe this, we believe that, we have hope and all of those things and still things happen, you know, different than what we would see them to be and what we feel that are, are the right thing. Yeah. And it's about, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And it, I could have an all night discussion on that one thing after I read the Psalms that were assigned tonight because, um, you know, we talk all just, night and well, just a small thing would be, for instance, three generations in one family and all of their extended family and friends praying. And she still passed yep. from this ridiculous pandemic that has us engulfed, you know. And it, it just really hit home to me when I finished the last song uh, for this, this assignment tonight. So, you know, I guess we could go on and on about why does, why does this, ha you know, why does it always come out right? Why are we not always like trees by streams of water? So. Uh, and that's a, that's a whole semester worth of question, I realize. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because you did exactly what the Psalms are meant to do. Which is why they gave you language. You, you, you know, like you said, sometimes you read them and you feel encouragement, which you should. And sometimes you read them and you read those laments and I know you didn't care for them, but now think what you just did was a lament. Right. You lamented, but then at the end, you even came back just like the lament songs. You came back and said, but I, I, I still know we should study them. I still know we ought to be, you know, that I believe this. I, you know, that's a, that's a statement of faith. You see, the Psalms really give us these words. They give us these backgrounds and, and the ability to understand that, look, sometimes life is full of praise. Sometimes I, I mean, we are so full of praise, we can't, can't get, just can't get out of our system fast enough. And sometimes there are days of lament where, Lord, I'm mad. Lord, I'm sad. Today did not go the way I hoped it would. And, 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 and yet, in both of those, God hears those and accepts those. Sometimes, I need a good kick in the booty. God, follow in the ways of righteousness. Stop doing that. You know better than that. Because you know that that road leads you down that direction. You don't want to go that way. You want to go this way. Sometimes I need to hear that. You need to hear that. That's how these things speak. Because they give us vocabulary. They give us, they give us this, this incredible amount of, 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 of information, but in a way that speaks to the heart of our soul. I think I said this. I'm not sure if I said this since we've been recording or not, but I, I said it right before we started. For me, the Psalms are, are, are like that song that you just need at the right time. You know, I know in my life, I, I, I can remember my Mimi, who's, who's been gone now a number of years. But when she was really sad, she never sang Amazing Grace with the right words, but she sang Amazing Grace. <laughs> that was her song. And when she was happy, she'd sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. I, 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 knew what my, I knew what mood my Mimi was in by the song she was singing, okay? But which song is more valid? The rah-rah of the Battle Hymn of the Republic? Or the sweet kind of sort of very, very heartfelt, very solemn, amazing grace? Which one is more valid? They're both valid. They're both important. Sometimes you need to sing, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And sometimes you got to sing, rescue the perishing. 
two completely different thoughts. But they both matter. And that's what the Psalms do. They give credence to all of our emotions. Those emotions of, hey, I'm going down the right path today. Good, keep going down that path. Those emotions of, today was great, God, thank you. Those emotions of, God, today has been long and arduous. God says, I know, I'm with you though. And sometimes those moments, like I said, like tonight, Sometimes you just need a good kick in the booty to do the right thing. That's why the Psalms are so powerful. That's why we still study them. That's why, I mean, look at like, if you've ever seen a like Gideon New Testament, it always has the Psalms and the Proverbs in it. And I think it's vital that we keep reading and keep studying these Psalms because they really do help us speak to God with all the language and all the vocabulary and all the emotions that we all face. Look, so you said it. I wish, I really do wish that every day I was full of praise and excited and happy every day. But I've, I've been honest with you. I'm not today. I'm sad. And it would really, really hurt if I thought that God only, only heard me when I was in praise mode. But see, the Psalms say something different. They say, no, God hears you in praise. God hears you in lament. God hears you when you're trying to do the things that are right. And God hears you when you do the things that are wrong. God hears no matter what. And for me, that is one of the most gorgeous things about the Psalms as a whole is that God will listen no matter what. All right. Any thoughts, comments about that or anything else with the Psalms? Good work tonight. I hope these have been helpful for you. I, I love studying the Psalms. Um, I could take one Psalm a week and just study it for 150 weeks. They're so good. Um, I know there's other things we want to go over and study, but um, I encourage you keep reading them. Uh, pick a Psalm a, a day or pick a Psalm a week, you know, um, but, but, but live with that Psalm, read them, uh, let them help you speak to God and convey everything that you're feeling. All right. Good job tonight. Good work. Um, thank you all. Good discussion tonight. Uh, I love that we're getting now we're much more comfortable speaking to each other on Zoom. Um, ben and I were talking about that the other day. I said, we're getting better. And tonight I thought it was great. Good interaction. So let me do this. Let me pray for us. And then I'm going to stop the recording and um, we'll, we'll call it a night. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for those times of praise, for those times of remember your authority for those times of lament, for those times of thanksgiving, and even for those times where we seek wisdom. We thank you, God, that you hear all of our prayers. You receive all of our thoughts and feelings. And God, we thank you that you hear us and you love us because that gives us hope. And for all those things, we are grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Good.